Okay, part two. On Christmas Eve, Harry went to bed looking forward to next day for the food and the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. When he woke early next morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. Happy Christmas, said Ron sleepily as Harry scrambled out of bed and pulled on his dressing gown. You too, said Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. What did you expect? Turnips, said Ron, turning to his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the top parcel. It was wrapped in thick brown paper and scrawled across it was To Harry from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid had obviously whittled it himself. Harry blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclose your Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. Sellotaped to the note was a 50 pence piece. Hmm, that's friendly, said Harry. Ron was fascinated by the 50 pence. Hmm, weird, he said. What a shape. This is money. You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Hagrid and my aunt and uncle. So who sent these? I think I know who that one's from, said Ron, going a bit pink and pointing to a very lumpy parcel. My mum. I told her you didn't expect any presents and... Oh no, he groaned. She's made you a Weasley jumper. Harry had torn open the parcel to find a thick, hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a jumper, said Ron, unwrapping his own. And mine's always maroon. That's really nice of her, said Harry, trying the fudge, which was very tasty. His next present also contained sweets. It was a large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione. This left only one parcel. Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery grey went slithering to the floor, where it lay in gleaming folds. Ron gasped. <sighs> I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice, dropping the box of every flavour beans he'd got from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch. It was like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, a look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders and Ron gave a yell. <gasps> it is! Look down. Harry looked down at his feet, but they had gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him. Just his head suspended in midair, his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized the letter. Written in narrow, loopy writing that he had never seen before, were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give anything for one of these, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who'd sent the cloak? Had it really belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open and Fred and George Weasley bounded in. Harry stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else yet. Merry Christmas. Hey, look. Harry's got a Weasley jumper too. Fred and George were wearing blue jumpers, one with a large yellow F on it, 
the other with a large yellow G. Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding up Harry's jumper. She obviously makes more effort, more of an effort if you're not family. Why are you wearing yours, Ron? George demanded. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. Oh, I hate maroon, Ron moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name. But we're not stupid. We know we're called Gred and Forge. What's all this noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disapproving. He'd clearly come halfway through unwrapping his presents as he too carried a lumpy jumper over his arm, which Fred seized. P for prefect. Go on, get it on, Percy. Come on, we're all wearing ours. Even Harry got one. I, I don't want, said Percy thickly, as the twins forced the jumper over his head, knocking his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the prefects today either, said George. Christmas is a time for family. They frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his heart sides by the jumper. Harry had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of fat chipolatas, tureens of buttered peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic crackers were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually bought, with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred, and it didn't just bang. It went off with a blast like a cannon and engulfed them all in a cloud of blue smoke, while from the inside exploded a rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up on the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointed wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine. Finally, kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed, her top hat lopsided. When Harry finally left, left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons, a grow your own warts kit, and his own new wizard chess kit set. The white mice had disappeared and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight in the grounds. Then, cold, wet and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a tea of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifle and Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed, except sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they'd stolen his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas ever. Yet something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it. The invisibility cloak and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake and with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his four-poster. Harry leant over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. His father's. This had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. He had to try it now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. 
Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was open to him in this cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Hmm, should Harry wake him? Something held him back, his father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory down the stairs, across the common room, and climbed through the portrait hole. Who's there? squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing, and thought. And then it came to him. The restricted section in the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took to find out who Flamel was. So he set off, drawing the invisibility cloak tight around him as he walked. All right, we're on page 151. That's how much we've read. That's how much is left. Okay, everybody. I shall see you tomorrow.